Margie and Baxter. Raise your hands, Margie and Baxter. So you know our Margie and Baxter. Pastor Joey is their son. Uh, and then he, he pastor, he's a pastor of recovery at Woods Edge Church in Spring, Texas. And so we're so grateful that you're with us. And so you guys give him one more round of applause for what the Lord's going to give to us through you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, to be honest, I don't know how to follow what we just experienced. Like we should just all go home because that was incredible. Okay. Um, well, my name is Joey Swenson. And, and as Don was saying, I am uh, one of the pastors of a church called Woods Edge Community Church. And I have the privilege of leading a recovery uh, program there. And uh, it, is, it is an awesome ministry. It's called Regeneration. And we gather together on Monday nights. And it's really, it's designed for everyone in the church. And it's this, criti- uh, it's this biblically-based, Christ-centered program where people are just seeking freedom in Christ. It's so good. And we're seeing just a lot of lives being transformed. And it's just a joy to get to do that. And, and it's a joy to be here today with you this morning. And so I just wanted to say thank you uh, for having me. Uh, just a little bit about me. I was uh, born and raised in uh, South America. I was born in Colombia uh, and then lived in Ecuador for a long time. And because of that, uh, many, many of you know my parents, Baxter and Margie, and, uh, but we were missionaries there. And, and because we grew up on the mission field, uh, I was pretty much born into the church. Um, I was born into the church and I, I, I always, I, I don't ever remember not knowing Jesus. You know what I mean? Like that was just the upbringing that I had. Um, and it was, it was a great experience. And I think because of uh, being born and surrounded by ministry, and the church my whole life, you just, as a kid, you start hearing a lot of Christianese very early on. Are you with me? Like for any of you that, have, that grew up in the church, you, you hear these words as a kid, um, you know, holiness and, and being pure. And, and I just, I have a confession. I have a confession that one of my least favorite words growing up as a kid was this word repent. Repent. Are you with me? Okay, right? I'm not the only one. And, and so I don't know if that word stirs up any emotions inside of you. But for me, that word for a really long time, it just bothered me. It bothered me. Because in my mind, it was associated with legalism. Uh, it was associated with following rules and regulations. Uh, it was a word that was connected to, to sin and then feeling really guilty about uh, what I did. And, um, and, and ultimately, it was because I couldn't live up to the standards of the Bible, and I couldn't live up to the standards of the missionary kid community that I grew up in. And so that word really bothered me. And so I had, you know, uh, uh, you know you, you, uh, when you're in that moment and as a kid and you're hearing this word and you don't really fully know what it means, I mean, it comes with maybe feelings of shame. Uh, thoughts can really easy, uh, easily creep in of, man, I'm just, I'm failing. Because in my community, it's all about serving Jesus and loving Jesus and, and being good and, and being holy as God is holy, right? And so you have these feelings of like, am I failing? Am, am I disappointing God because I went back to that sin or I keep struggling with that thing? And so as a kid, I, you know, I, I also, and maybe you've heard this before, but you hear, uh, repent or you're going to hell. Repent or you're going to hell. And so this is, as a kid growing up, and I, I just want to just, for the record, my parent that wasn't the, the message my parents were telling me at home. They're not like, hey, we love you. You're going to hell unless you're, they weren't doing that. Um, but I was a part of a, of a broader evangelical community. And you hear these things growing up. You hear these things. Who's with me? Okay, I'm not the only one. All right. All um, right. You know, and then, and then lastly with that, I, you know, just this idea, I had this belief that God's angry um, because of my sin. And if I don't repent, like, man, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. And so this word just carries weight. This word carries weight. And it sounds like for many of you, it does as well. But I'm here this morning to tell you that that word repent is one of the most beautiful words in the scriptures. It is a beautiful word. It is actually one of the most beautiful concepts that we can find in the Bible. And so today I wanna talk a little bit about that word repent. 
Now, first in the Gospel of Matthew, at the start of Jesus' ministry, in Matthew 4, 17, uh, he says, uh, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So connected to repent is this idea that something beautiful and good, this kingdom is coming, it's here, it's now. And then in Mark 1, 15, Jesus says, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Friends, repentance is connected to good news. Not shame, fear, guilt, but good news. Are you still with me? Are you still with me? All right. So at the core, at the core of repentance is good news. And so today... I want to talk about a story in the scriptures, a story in the gospels, and it's a repentance story. And it's the story, many of you have heard it before, you know it, it's the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Yeah, Jesus, I I just uh, humbly come into this place and just say thank you. Thank you that you are a good father. Thank you that you're so good. And that you are calling out to people saying, I love you, come to me, and I will give you rest. And so, Father, right now, wherever we're at, I know every single one of us here, we represent a family, we represent a story, we represent different circumstances, because life, life is tough, life is hard, and, and we are just gathered here as a body saying, Jesus, we need you. Show up in this place. And so, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be honoring to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read from Luke 19. We have a slide uh, with that. Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Um, And I'm reading from uh, the ESV. And uh, this is what it says. He entered Jericho and was passing through. It's talking about Jesus. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on, a, but, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So I want to do a little recap of this passage because there's some really fascinating things going on in the story. So first, the story starts by saying that Jesus is passing through Jericho. it's the very first line. Jesus is passing through this town called Jericho. Now what Jesus is doing here, he's at, or I'm sorry, what Luke, the author is doing here, he's implying that Jesus is actually not planning to stay the night in Jericho. All right, Jesus is traveling to, and we know this because Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem to be uh, be there for the Passover. And so Luke is making it clear to the the reader uh, that Jesus is just passing through. He's not gonna stay the night. Okay, so that's important to to pay attention to. All right, so we we hear that. Um, And by the time that Jesus enters into this scene in in the life of Jesus, uh, people already know who he is, right? They know who he is. They're aware that this is like a renegade rabbi who's going around and he's, he's healing people and, and the things that he's teaching, I mean, he is, he's interpreting the law and the prophets uh, in, in, in a radical way. Uh, and, and he's doing it with authority, which is really amazing. And people are blown away by this person. He's doing it with authority. And there's even, uh, there's even rumors and murmurs that this guy is, is a prophet and maybe, just maybe he's even the Messiah. 
And so talk is going. And so Jesus is passing through this town, trying to get to Jerusalem. He's just passing through. And we know that the ancient world in that time, they were, they were a very hospitable culture. It was all about hospitality. And so you know that the crowd is gathered around them and everyone is saying, come, stay here, stay in this town, stay in our home, be our special guest. Everyone wants Jesus to stay. And yet again, we know at the beginning, Luke makes it clear, Jesus is just passing through. His plan is not to stay the night, not to stay the night. Well, then we get introduced to uh, Zacchaeus, our, our, main, our, main, uh, our main guy here. And this passage is intentional about kind of describing Zacchaeus to us, right? Um, first, we get his name. All right, we hear that his name is Zacchaeus. Now, sometimes it, when we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus uh, sometimes, or the, the Gospels, sometimes we get the person's name, sometimes we don't, right? Sometimes Jesus heals people and it's just the deaf and mute man or, or the blind man or he, he heals uh, the woman who was bleeding. Or sometimes when Jesus has this encounter with someone and he's teaching them, uh, it, again, it doesn't say their name, it's just the, the rich young ruler. But in this situation, for some reason, we get the name. You know, and so Zacchaeus, we get the name and we know that names are import, important, right? It's part of our culture. We, we put meaning to names and it, it was especially true for them as well. Now, I remember when uh, my wife was pregnant, uh, my son Jonas here, uh, he, was, he was still, uh, he wasn't born yet. And so we, my wife and I, Karen, we're talking and we're just deciding, you know, what are we going to name this boy? And as we were talking and as we were praying, we just felt the Lord saying, this boy is gonna be a gift. He's gonna be a gift. And so what we did is we started to research and we found all these different names that mean gift from God. And that's when we found the name Jonas. And that's why we chose it, Jonas. And, and that's the truth. He has been a gift to our family, a gift to our family. And so we know that in our own culture, in our own culture names matter. And again, it was especially true uh, in the ancient world. And so Zacchaeus, uh, that name is derived uh, from this name Zacchaeus. Say it with me, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, okay, so Zacchaeus derived from the name Zacchaeus. Now that's, what's interesting about the name Zacchaeus is that that, word, that name literally means pure and innocent. Pure and innocent. And so this is the name that Zacchaeus' name is derived from. Pure and innocent. And innocent. Here's something else that's pretty cool about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus uh, is found in the Old Testament. Um, and so uh, in, you can find his name in Ezra and Nehemiah. And Zacchaeus uh, was the name of the head of a household, the father, the head of a household of a family that returned home from exile. Isn't that interesting? So the name Zacchaeus is derived from Zacchaeus that means pure and innocent, from the name of a famous person in the scriptures whose family returns to exile, or returns from exile, sorry. So, uh, the next thing you know, we, uh, we, we find out his name. Uh, we also find out uh, what he does for a living, right? It says that he's the chief tax collector. Now, during the time of Jesus, uh, we, we know that uh, Judea was occupied by the Romans, right? And so, uh, you know, the big, bad Roman Empire, I mean, they have their presence there. They have politicians there. They have, govern they have uh, Roman soldiers there. They, they have a presence. But it's not, they're not the nice people necessarily, right? They are oppressing. They are taxing. They are mistreating. They can do a lot of terrible things to the, to the Jewish people. And so they're under Roman, uh, Roman occupation. And what the Romans would do is they would hire, they would get a Jewish person to come and to become a tax collector and use them uh, to take taxes from their own people. And so here, here is Zacchaeus and he is working for the enemy. He's working for the enemy. Um, it, also, uh, it also says that he was the chief tax collector. So it's not just that he's a tax collector, like taking money from his own people. I mean, this guy's in charge. This guy's in charge. And we know that corruption starts from the top. Corruption starts from the top. And so uh, he is the chief tax collector. In that culture, he would have been viewed by his own people. He would have been viewed as a robber. He would have been viewed as someone who actually was unclean and ritually impure. And so it's actually a bit ironic 
that his name is derived from Zakai that means unclean or that means pure and innocent when he amongst his own people is seen as impure. So fascinating. So then we also find out that he's wealthy, right? He's, he's rich. And again, the implication simply is that his wealth came, on, uh, came at the expense of his own people. He cheated people, uh, he stole from people, he defrauded people, and that's, that's the way he made his wealth. And so right just from the very beginning, I mean, we know a lot about this character, this tax collector. And then the, the story continues, and uh, we read that Zacchaeus, he wants to see Jesus, uh, but uh, the, as we famously know about this guy, what was he? He was short. I've heard it. He was a wee little man. Have you heard that before? Uh, he was little. Um, and so again, we're getting a little bit of his identity. Not only is he a tax collector, not only does he perceived as a robber, he's also like short. Like it's kind of an insult to injury, to, you know what I mean? Like he's short also. And uh, you know, in verse three it says, but on account of the crowd, he could, not see, he could not see because he was small in stature. Now what's interesting about this little bit right here is that scholars believe that what Luke, the author, is doing, he's using a play on words. That short on stature, yes, it meant he was short physically, but that term short uh, in stature was a term to describe someone who was inferior in the kingdom of God. Isn't that interesting? So in verse three where it says, on account of the crowd, he could not see. Luke is saying, it's not just, it, like yes, he's physically short, he's small, but it's more than that. He's, Luke is implying that the crowd doesn't want him there because they hate Zacchaeus. This is the guy that works for the enemy and steals from them. He doesn't belong to God's family because of his choices to be a traitor. And so essentially what this crowd is saying, on account of the crowd, it's as if they're saying, you know what, Jesus, the rabbi, the one who can heal people, he's for us. He's for the crowd. He's, he's not for corrupt tax collectors. Get out of here, let alone chief tax collectors. And so on account of the crowd, he couldn't see Jesus. And so Zachariah, uh, or Zacchaeus runs ahead, climbs up a sycamore tree and waits for Jesus to walk by. And it says that he was seeking to see Jesus. In spite of the hatred from his own people, something is drawing, drawing him to Jesus. Have you been there before? In spite of our stuff, junk, there's something about Jesus that draws, that we're drawn to. And so he, he was seeking to see Jesus. And so when Jesus gets to that place, Jesus looks up, calls him by name, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house. Now, as I was reading this part, I, I have some questions. I have some questions. How did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? Have you ever wondered that? Like, how did, how did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? Is it, did Jesus know uh, his name because he's God and he put on his God goggles and he just, he had the sense and he knew, maybe, that very, very likely it could be. Or could it be that someone in the crowd, this crowd that hates him, hates Zacchaeus, someone sees Zacchaeus hiding in the tree. And if the crowd hate this corrupt traitor, I wonder if someone saw him uh, up in the tree hiding and they just started to, ins to insult him, started to hurl insults. And then the next thing you know, uh, uh, they call out his name and, and the whole crowd joins in insulting the tax collector hiding in the tree. Could it be that Jesus heard Zacchaeus' name that way? Maybe. I wonder, I wonder if the crowd would have expected Jesus to join in and hurl insults at the, at the, the traitor. There's this incredible book, it's called uh, Jesus Through Me Middle Eastern Eyes by the author Kenneth Bailey. And he describes what the crowd would have expected Jesus to say to Zacchaeus. And this is what he writes. Zacchaeus, you are a collaborator. You are an oppressor of these good people. You have drained the economic lifeblood of your people and given it to the imperialists. You have betrayed your country and your God. This community's hatred of you is fully justified. You must quit your job, repent, journey to Jerusalem for ceremonial purification, return to Jericho and apply yourself to keeping the law. 
if you are willing to do these things on my next trip to Jericho, I will enter your newly purified house and offer my congratulations. <laughs> that's, that's what they would have expected Jesus, a rabbi, to say to a tax collector. But we know that's not what Jesus said. Instead, Jesus looks up and says to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up, come down, for I must stay at your house today. Friends, that response would have been like a bomb going off in, in that crowd. It would have been scandalous. And so back to my question, did Jesus use his God goggles and, and know that he was up there or, or did he hear Zacchaeus' name from the crowd? And the, the truth is, is we, we can't know for sure based on our passage, uh, but my personal belief is that he didn't use the God goggles. I, I think that the crowd saw Zacchaeus first and started to insult him. And the reason is, is that as we read the Gospels, all throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus responding to people always to make a point. Jesus was a teacher. He's, he's this rabbi who would speak in parables and was always making people rethink and uh, rethink how they understood the kingdom of God. And so remember, Luke made mention that Jesus is just passing through Jericho, just passing through this town in verse one, but something changes Jesus' mind. And it seems that out of a response to the crowd, Jesus decides to live out what the kingdom of God actually looks like and that, that he has come to seek and to save the lost. And so now, instead of just passing through Jericho, he is now saying, Zacchaeus, I must I must, so that the, this town can see what my kingdom looks like, I must stay in your home. It's as if Jesus is making the point, if the people in this town are going to understand the kingdom of God, then they need to understand the heart of my father. And my father is the one who can forgive and save even the most hated man in this town. Talk about unexpected love unexpected love. Zacchaeus, I must stay in your house tonight. And so then we continue on in the story and the crowd's not happy, right? It says that the crowd sees this and they all grumble. They all grumble. He's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. And once again, the crowd speaks another identity over Zacchaeus, an identity that went with the territory. He's a sinner. And because he's viewed as a sinner, Zacchaeus' house is defiled ritually. Zacchaeus' house would have been defiled ritually, which means if Jesus sits in his chairs and sleeps in his guest bed, he will emerge the next morning as defiled. And no rabbi, and especially no Messiah, should ever, ever behave in such a manner. This is unexpected love, friends. And Jesus goes, he goes to the house. Well, in that culture, Zacchaeus would have thrown a big banquet for his special guests. For Jesus, for his disciples, they, they would have had a party. That, that was, they were a hospitality culture. And so uh, at some point, starting in verse eight, Zacchaeus uh, stands up and this is what he says in the midst of this, this banquet, in the midst of this time with Jesus, he says, behold, Lord, Half my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone, if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. You see, we're getting, into the, uh, we're getting a glimpse into the impact that Jesus can have on someone's life. Jesus can impact, radically change someone's life. My guess is many of us are here because Jesus has radically impacted our lives. And my hope and our prayer is that it's because of unexpected love. We're changed not because we fear hell. We're changed because of unexpected love. You still with me? You see, so much, Zacchaeus is, is so overwhelmed by Jesus, by this unexpected love, that it, he, end up, he ends up having this repentance moment. Repentance moment. Oh no, that word. I use the word repent. Friends, as I mentioned before, I believe the word repent is one of the most beautiful words in the scriptures. In the Greek, uh, the word for repent is metanoia. 
Say it with me, metanoia. Metanoia, it means to change your thinking. Meta, change, noia, thinking. To change your thinking. To change how you think about everything. To change the way you think about your sin, about your brokenness, about your failures, about your mistakes, and to change the way you think about your circumstances. Metanoia. And then in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, the word for repent is teshuva. Say it with me, teshuva. Teshuva. It means to turn and to go in a different direction. So teshuva, if, if, if I'm going in this direction, I, this is what's representing my life, my brokenness, my sin, my junk. To repent is to turn from that and to go in a different direction. To change my thinking about what this is doing to my own life, to other people's lives, to change my thinking and to go in another direction. And here's the thing, it, what's really cool, it's less about what you're leaving, that's important, but it's more about where you're going to. That's the implication of teshuva. It's about where you're headed. Isn't that cool? Metanoia, teshuva, your sin, your brokenness, your wrong thinking about yourself and your wrong thinking about God, those things, destroy, they destroy our lives. They destroy our lives and they keep us captive. And so repent means to change and to go in a different direction. And, and, and here's, this is really cool. The root word of teshuva is shub. Shub, and the word shub means rest, rest. So think about that. When we repent, when we decide, listen, my, my brokenness, my junk, my sin, I need to think differently about it. I need to move and go in a different direction that that is where I'm gonna find rest for my soul. Oh, friends, repentance is a beautiful thing. It's a thing that we're being invited to by Jesus. That is where good news is. Repentance is where you're gonna experience rest for you, for your family, for your future. Repentance is a beautiful thing. Rest for your souls, that, that is good news. And so when, Mark, when Jesus in Mark 1 says, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is here, it's now, it has come near. Repent, change your thinking, believe the good news. That, friends, that is, that is a good message, not one of anger and shame and guilt. Are you still with me? Amen. So Zacchaeus encounters Jesus and he has this repentance moment, this metanoia teshuva moment where he's thinking and he starts to change how he views everything. And, and then Zacchaeus realizes that instead of defrauding and cheating people, he's gonna do things differently. He's gonna live generously. He's gonna pay people back what he owes because that is just a better way to live. It's a better way to live. I don't know if you've ever been there before, uh, but when, when we give, and I'm not just talking about the church, but when we're generous with people in life, it's a better way to live. It's a better way to live. So this is what Zacchaeus is, uh, is doing here. Uh, I lost my place. And thank you. Uh, it's out of that place that Jesus then proclaims, today, today, salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so this story reminds me that when I'm willing to fully receive Jesus' unexpected love, that it has the ability to create unexpected change in my own life. Let me say that again. When we, when we are willing to fully receive unexpected love, it has the ability to create unexpected change in our lives. If you're in a season where you're, where you're looking at junk in your life and, and, and you want unexpected change, uh, start thinking, is there, is there an area where I'm not rece fully receiving Jesus' God's unexpected love? It's a good question to ask. Is there any area where I'm not fully receiving your, God's love today? So, um, to me, this is such a beautiful story. And, and friends, that was just the recap. I, I got some really cool stuff to share, okay? That was just the recap. Are you all still with me? Okay, okay. So I wanna share a couple things that I learned in my studies. So cool, all right, so cool. So the first thing that I learned about this passage is that there's a theme going on here. And I don't know if just reading it, you, you just caught the theme, but that theme all throughout woven this little passage is a theme all about seeing, all about seeing, 
Now, I, I have another slide. And what I did here is uh, I, I made all the words bold in the next slide. I think we have a slide. There we go. Can you see it? Can you see the bold? Maybe not. Okay. So um, I put in bold all the words uh, that are connected to seeing. So in verse 2, it says, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now that word behold in the, in the Greek is edu, and, and it's like saying, look, see, behold. All right, so that word is look, see. Then in verse three, uh, it says, and he was seeking to see who Jesus is. In verse four, he climbs, Zacchaeus climbs up a sycamore tree to see Jesus. In verse five, we see that Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, come, hurry and come down. In verse seven, it then talks about the crowd seeing Jesus, right? And then in verse eight, we get that behold word again. Look, and this is where Zacchaeus is saying, everyone look, see, all right? You still with me? Okay, so six different times in just this pretty short passage, we have these words, this this theme of seeing and looking. And of these six different times, uh, three different Greek words are used here. Three different words. Okay, so let me show you. Next slide. Next slide. This time I, highlight, I highlighted them so you can see. Is it, does color work on this or no? Because it was highlighted in color. Do we know? Maybe not. Okay. Well, never mind. Okay, we'll have to make do. Okay, so what I did in my original uh, slides is I highlighted the words that are, that are similar, okay? So um, in verse two, behold, and verse six, behold, or uh, the, the last verse, behold, those are the same word, okay? Then in verse three, to see, and verse four, to see, and then if you go down to verse seven where the crowd saw, that is also another word, okay? So that's a second word that's different. And then the third word where it says Jesus looked up, that is the third Greek word, okay? Six different times we're getting this theme of seeing three different words. And so I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Who cares? Like, who ca- <laughs> like why does that matter? But, but friends, th- th- that's a great question, but this is where it gets kind of cool. This is, get- okay, stay with me. So this story about Jesus and a tax collector is set up, this is set up as something called a chiasm. Okay, say that word with me, chiasm. Chiasm, okay. So a chiasm is a literary device in which a sequence of ideas is presented and then repeated in reverse order. Okay, so let me show you uh, an example of a simple chiasm. Next slide. Okay. So this is uh, Benjamin Franklin's axiom and it said, where he said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Okay, so you see the, the, repetitive, uh, the repetitive symmetry. There's an A line, a B line, failing, prepare, preparing, fail. Okay, you all with me? Okay, you guys are so smart. This is amazing. My parents said, you, no, they didn't say anything. So, Here we have uh, the words failing and prepare. They're repeated in reverse order in the second half of the sentence. And so the structure is A, B, B, A. Now other chiasms are more complex, okay? And they they can even, they can span like an entire poem, which is really cool. And and so what chiasms do is they create this mirror effect uh, where the different lines can have similar or they can have contrasting ideas in them. And these ideas are reflected back uh, in a passage, oftentimes using uh, like repeated words, okay? Um, and, and here's what's really cool, is that in the scriptures, chiasms are all over. It's awesome. It's, it's so cool. And I am totally geeking out here. So uh, let, let me show you what's happening in our story, okay? Um, why don't we go, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So instead of A, B, B, A, in our story, we are getting A, B, C, B, A, okay? So you see the passage up there and then that, that, is, the, that is our uh, chiastic structure, okay? And in this structure, 
The A and the B are repeated in re reverse order, but that third C line, uh, that is there because the author wants to point to it. It's like the author is saying, everyone, this is special emphasis. Pay attention. Okay, so A, B, C, B, A. So now with more complex chiasms, they are designed to create more insight into the story um, as you compare and contrast these mirroring ideas. Okay, so for example, for example, um, you can go ahead and, and go to the next, next slide. In, in line B, all right, in the, the two that, that are line B, all right, uh, we hear the word is horao, all right, horao. And in the first line B, uh, it is, it is uh, when Zacchaeus is wanting to see Jesus, okay? And then in the, the second B, it's when the crowd wants to see Jesus, okay? So it's giving us that, that mirroring effect. Now, this word horao is really interesting, okay? Because it means to see, but it means to see or to perceive, to perceive. So often when this word is used, it's with a metaphorical meaning. Isn't that interesting? And so the implication here is that physical seeing is connected to something that happens in the mind and in the heart. It, it, what's happening in the mind and the heart of the one who is seeing. So again, another way to think about it is to see something physically, which then becomes the bridge to spiritual and mental seeing. Isn't that interesting? So here in our story, in these B, B lines, we are getting a contrast of what's happening in the minds and in the hearts of Zacchaeus and what's happening in the mind and the heart of the crowd. All right, so when the crowd sees Jesus offer unexpected love to their enemy, what do they do? They grumble, they're angry. And when Jesus offers Zacchaeus unexpected love, he gladly receives Jesus with joy. It's this contrast so that we can see. It's, the, it's interesting, it's the traitor who chooses to repent. It's, it's the unclean tax collector who's actually transformed by the good news of Jesus. And so the author is making clear something is happening in the way, the difference in how someone who sees Jesus and allows Jesus to transform our minds and our hearts as opposed to someone who sees Jesus and it does nothing. Isn't that interesting? And so we're getting, we're getting that contrast. So now um, maybe a good question for us is how do I respond when Jesus shows unexpected love for my enemy? Whoa. How do you respond to the unexpected love that Jesus has for the person that votes differently than you? How do you respond uh, when Jesus offers unexpected love to the person that in your mind you just can't stand? We need to repent. We need to change the way we think about that because Jesus invites us to love our God and to love our neighbor. And when he calls us to love our neighbor, he says, yeah, your neighbor includes your enemy. And I need to change the way I think and I need to start moving in a different direction because that's where rest for my soul is. When I can love even my enemy. So back to the chiasm. As the author writes this story, by using this type of literary device, Luke is giving this reader extra things to think about without having to write a whole other commentary. It's so fascinating. And so I learned that uh, in this type of a chiasm where there's A, B, C, B, A, uh, the author is doing a, a couple really important things, all right? And so the first thing is bookends, the bookends. The bookends are there for a reason. All right, uh, the lines A, behold, and then at the end, behold. The writer is saying, they're at the beginning and at the end because I want you to pay attention. I want you to, to think about what happens here, what's going on at the beginning of the story, and then I want you to pay attention to what, ha what has now happened at the end of the story. Okay, so the bookends are really, really important. Go back, what happened? Okay, that's not the slide. Oh, sorry, is that someone's car? Oh, my. <laughs> I'm like, what did I do? Um, so anyway, uh, you can go to the next slide. There we go. So, so in line A, where he says, behold, that word, like I said, it means look, see. It's like this idea of like, hey, hey, everybody, check this out, check this out. That word is idu, idu. Now in the first section, the first line A, 
This is where we get insight again into Zacchaeus' identity. We already talked about it, right? He's, he's this traitor. He's small in stature. He's an outsider. He's less than in the kingdom of God. And so we're getting a picture. This is how maybe he saw himself before God. Um, this is maybe how others saw Zacchaeus, right, within, it, within their community. And then ultimately, this is before he has this encounter with Jesus. This is the type of life before Teshuva, before Teshuva, okay? So then if we go down to the last A, the last behold in verse eight, this is that contrasting line. And again, now this time Zacchaeus is standing up and he's saying, hey everyone, look, behold. And he's saying, instead of greed and power, I wanna choose the way of Jesus. I wanna choose a better way to live. He's choosing to put his trust in something that's different. Isn't that cool? When we truly seek to see Jesus and we allow him into every aspect of our lives, it will lead to metanoia and it will lead to toshuva. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is happening in this A, A passage. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. Friends, that is what the bookends are doing. That's what Luke is trying to allude to. Pay attention to Zacchaeus before his encounter with Jesus and look what happens when you encounter Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Everything changes. You live differently. You look at people differently. Isn't that so cool? Our scriptures are amazing. So the last of our chiastic structure you can go to the next slide. Actually move two slides. Yeah, go, go to the next slide. Here in the A, B, C, B, A, here we have that middle line. And as I mentioned before, this is where the author is saying, all right, reader, listener to this passage, this is what I focus. This is the focal point. This is what this whole story is about. I want you to pay attention to what's happening right here. Everything else is important. It's, it's there for a reason. But this middle point, this C moment, this, this is what I want you to pay attention to. Now that word where it says Jesus looked up, this is the, our third different word and the word is anablepo. Say it with me, anablepo. Anablepo. Y'all are Greek scholars. This is amazing. Um, anablepo. It simply means physically see. That's all it means. Like the physical looking at someone. Anablepo. And so here we have this moment that we've had six different moments of words talking about seeing and looking. And yet and there's this, just this one simple moment where Jesus stops and he looks. He looks right at Zacchaeus. And I don't know about you, but there's something really beautiful about the simplicity of that. When I was in ninth grade, I was, uh, I was the smallest in my class. I was really skinny. Uh, I was really short. I was shorter than all the guys. I was shorter than a lot of the girls. Uh, I, I hadn't uh, experienced uh, puberty yet as a ninth grader, so that's embarrassing. Uh, and And... You know, it's one of those things everybody around me is changing. They're getting hair in weird places. Am I allowed to say that, Mom, in church? You, are we cool? Uh, so so I'm, I'm behind, and I look young. I have, I mean, without my beard, uh, I look young. Not that I had a beard in ninth grade, but um, I, I just look really young. And so this was a season of my life where, you know, you're starting to become really insecure about your body, about who you are, about, you know, why is it that everybody else is growing and I'm not? And, and um, in that ninth grade year, not only was that happening where I'm just having some internal insecurities about who I am, I also, for some reason, all my close friends kind of started to, to treat me differently. And they stopped inviting me to just like go hang out or spend the night or go to parties like at their houses or whatever. One of my best friends, actually my best friend currently today, so we obviously reconciled. Uh, but at the time, he, uh, he was uh, with this girl and, and the girl's like, hey, Phil, uh, when's your party uh, tonight? Uh, it was like a Friday night. When's your party? And, and he was like, did like one of these, you know, like elbowed her because he didn't want me to go. 
And so as this little kid who's little, skinny, looks young, is insecure, now your friends are like not treating you right and they're not inviting you to things. I mean, I just, I felt unseen. I felt uh, kind of just in this really vulnerable season of life. Well, I remember um, that was my ninth grade year. My brother, Jeff, uh, he was a senior in high school that year. And I don't know what came over him, uh, but he just in his kindness he started inviting me to go to things with him. A senior in high school to a little freshman, immature, hasn't hit puberty, come with us to go hang out and go to movies and hang out with his friends. And there was something so, that, that will always stay with me as a moment where someone just like looked at me and said, I see you. I see you. I, I don't know all that stuff right now, but I see you and you matter. Like you, you're really important. And I love that that word anablepo is there where Jesus just, it's as if he has this like intimate connection moment where he says, I see you. And that's one of the first things I want you to hear right now. Whatever's going on in life. Some of you are walking into this place and you, you're experiencing crazy, hard, difficult circumstances. And maybe, maybe it's, uh, you know, family members who are off doing things or maybe there's issues within your, your own relationships or maybe there's health issues or whatever's going on in your life. And it's really easy in those moments to wonder, God, like, do you even care? <laughs> Where are you? And one of the first things I just want to say is that we serve a God a creator. Remember, Jesus was God with skin, flesh, and bones walking around. And this God looks in your circumstances, looks at you, and says, I, I see you. I see you. And you matter. And you're valuable in my kingdom. Jesus sees you. So, anyway, there's this moment where Jesus sees him and he says, I must, I must stay in your home. I must stay in your home tonight. There's something powerful that happens when you really look at someone and make them feel like they matter and they're valuable. And so Jesus stops to look at Zacchaeus and then he says, uh, he says, come down. And again, we know the implications of Jesus choosing to stay the night at Zacchaeus' home. Uh, it was this unexpected love, repentance moment. It was beautiful. Uh, but there's something else that's happening in that middle C section that I found in my studies that I'm just, I'm so excited to, to tell you about, all right? So um, in our passage, there's three moments, there's three moments where the, um, Zacchaeus's name is mentioned, all right? Uh, the first is in verse two. Uh, there was a man named Zacchaeus, right? And we get that, okay? And then in verse five, that's our middle piece where it says that Jesus looks up at him and he calls him by name Zacchaeus. So that's the second time we see the, the name Zacchaeus. And then in verse eight, uh, we get it when Zacchaeus says, he stands up and he says, look, behold, I, I've changed. I'm having this repentance moment. And so go, go to um, the next slide. Go to the next one. Let's see. Uh, okay, stay there. All right, so I don't know if you can see what I did is in verse two, I wrote out Zacchaeus's name in the original Greek, okay? So you see it, and behold, there was a man named Zach. That's how you would say, uh, that's how it's written, Zacchaeus. It's also in verse eight, and Zacchaeus. Are you all with me? Can you see that? Okay, that's how it's written in the original Greek. Now, that little C at the very end with the tail, that is the, the, way, the S sound, okay, Zacchaeus. So you can kind of, even though I don't speak Greek, we don't speak Greek, it's like, oh yeah, I could see how you get the name Zacchaeus from that, right? You still with me? Okay, so... Um, now what I want you to do, watch this. This is so cool. Next slide. In our C middle passage, when Jesus comes to this place and he looks up at Zacchaeus, go to that next slide. Okay, this is how it's originally written in the Greek. In verse two and verse eight, Zacchaeus in verse five, when Jesus looks at him and calls him by name, the S sound is missing. It's written differently. It's written differently. Instead of saying Zacchaeus with the S at the end of it, he says his name that would have sounded like Zakai. Zakai. Wow. 
Zakai, the name that Zacchaeus is derived from in the Hebrew. It appears as if Jesus is referencing, is calling him out by this name. Isn't that incredible? That is so cool. Zakai, the name of the Israelite head of household who, who was known in their scriptures for returning back from the exile. The name that means pure and innocent. Isn't that incredible? Jesus, the, the author saying, this is the main thing. I call you, I see you differently than the rest of the world. The rest of the world says you're a traitor. The rest of the world says you're an enemy. The rest of the world says you've defrauded. Those things, they're part of your past. But in my kingdom, the way I see you, talking to Jesus, he says you are returning from exile. You are pure and you are innocent. That is who you are in my kingdom. How beautiful is that? Friends, that is true for us as well. That in spite of your sin, in spite of your past, in spite of your brokenness, in spite of the, the places you've been, in spite of the things that you've done to people, in spite of what's been done to you, in spite of your circumstances, you might have these beliefs, oh, I'm, I'm a failure, I'm, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I, I'm always gonna mess up, I, I'm always gonna fail. Jesus says, no, 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 don't you understand? I see you for who you really are. I see you for who you really are. Jesus has just claimed Zacchaeus' true kingdom identity over him. That is so good. That is so good. I love uh, that, again, he would have been known as a sinner, as a traitor, as all these things. And Jesus is like, nope. <laughs> nope. Not in my kingdom. You're part of my family. You're part of the family where God, where God we have called our family to be a blessing to the nations. That's who we're called to be. And that's who you are, Zacchaeus. Metanoia, change your thinking. This is who you are. You are my son returning from exile and I see you as pure and innocent. Friends, to repent is one of the most beautiful words, one of the most beautiful invitations that God is calling us to. Repent, change our thinking because that's where rest, that's where peace, that's actually where real life is, and that is good news. Repent. The God who in spite of our sin and shame, our mistakes, our poor decisions, in spite of what others say or even what we think about ourselves, that this God looks at you, calls you by name because he's inviting us to a better way to live. And so tonight, or tonight, it's only the day. Today, friends, I just wanna leave you with one, two last thoughts. Is there anything you need to repent from? And again, I want to remind you, I want to remind you that that's a beautiful word. It's a beautiful word. Whatever that word maybe conjures up in your mind because of your past or growing up around the church, get, get rid of that. Because repentance is an invitation to a better way to live. It means to change your thinking and it means to go in a different direction. And so maybe you're stuck in a destructive pattern or behavior that's robbing you of joy or peace. Uh, this is a moment to seek Jesus. It's a moment to seek after him, to turn and to go in a different direction. And I know if you need help with that, a lot of times when we're stuck in patterns, destructive patterns, it's really hard. I I'm a recovery pastor, I know. It's really hard if we're stuck in sin and brokenness. And so ask for help, ask for help. The first step of our recovery program is just admit. <laughs> admit that I need help. So many of us are, we're prideful. We, I don't need help. I got this. I'll figure it out. It's not that bad. I'll, you know, just get a in a little time, I'll change. It's like, no, admit, ask for help. So if you need help, there's a staff here. They'd, they'd love to help you with that. If, if you're willing to drive an hour to where we're at, come to our Monday night group. Uh, it's called Regeneration. We'd love to have you. Um, Again, maybe, uh, so maybe you're, uh, the first thing is I've just an invitation to repent. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And then the second thing I want to encourage you to do is uh, just an assignment for the week. All right, are we willing to, to, to do that? An assignment? Can I leave you with something? This is the assignment. I want to encourage you every day this week, every day this week to do one thing. I want you to ask God a question. In your alone time, as whether you journal, however you do it, I want you to ask God a question. 
I want you to ask, God, how do you see me? How do you see me in your kingdom? Because really, because a lot of times what we do is we believe lies. We believe lies and we believe uh, these lies about our identity. And we view ourselves through the lens of uh, what people have said or through the lens of our experiences or maybe just the things that we've said in our minds over and over to ourselves because of our past, because of our brokenness. And so what would it look like if every day this week, just in your alone time, you ask that question, God, how do you see me? How do you see me? The truth is that the father sees you through the lens of his son, through the one that can even call out a tax collector, hated traitor and call beautiful, pure, innocent son, son of Abraham, that God can do an incredible thing in your life and can speak truth over you. And so uh, that's what I'm inviting us to. God, how do you see me in your kingdom? Pray with me. Jesus, thank you so much for uh, today and just the, the blessing it was to be in this place, to worship you, to, to, to sing worthy, worthy, worthy. You are worthy. Thank you for the privilege of being in this place and getting to open up your scriptures and knowing that your scriptures are alive and active and they can pierce the deepest parts of our hearts. And so Father, I I just ask now that if there's someone here that is struggling with uh, an area that's just caught wreaking havoc in their lives, um, maybe it's hidden sin, maybe it's uh, whatever it is, maybe it's just rebellion, I I don't know, but God, that, that we would be, this would be a congregation of people that are constantly repenting, (laughs) seeking the better way, turning and going in a better direction and that they would do it together. Thank you. And God, I pray that we, that this body would be a a body of people that, that would live into their kingdom identities, that they wouldn't believe the lies of the enemy of what the world says or even their own flesh, God, that they would believe the truth that you, you, Jesus, You call us your sons, you call us your daughters. And God, I pray just anyone here who's struggling to believe in that unexpected love, God, would you just show up? Would you reveal yourself? I don't know, I'm I'm just gonna take a moment. I'm just, let's ask God right now. God, would you speak to every single one of us here? God, would you silence the voice of the enemy, the flesh, the world right now? That may, those voices don't, they, they have no right. God, we wanna hear from you and you alone. May only the voice of truth and life be heard right now. And so would you speak using a picture, an image, a word, a sound? God, speak to us. God, how do you see us in your kingdom? Reveal yourself now, God. How do you see each one of us? How do you see us? And Lord, if there's a lie that we're believing about our identity that you want to reveal so that we can bring it out into the light, God, what lie? Is there a lie that maybe some of us here are believing about our identity, about our worth, about our value in your kingdom? Just reveal that. What's a lie? And Lord, is there a truth? Is there a truth you want to replace it with? Jesus, thank you that you have the power, you have the power because you're worthy to transform every one of our lives. And we receive today your love for us. And we pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.